Okay, <clears throat> I hate to interrupt you, but rest assured, this is just the beginning. <clears throat> you will have opportunities to talk again about the short takes tonight and also to delve more deeply into the graphic novel uh, images and captions and all that over the next uh, couple of days. So this is uh, only the start. Uh, but tonight we have, uh, we're very lucky to have two, I'm uh, sorry, three excellent um, uh, short takes presenters, um, and as as Peter Peter told you, uh, their bios are already on you know on the on the the uh, pieces of paper. They're on the website, so so we're not going to spend uh, you know a few seconds uh, recounting any of their amazing accomplishments or qualifications. Uh, so I, I'm actually just going to spend a few minutes teasing them. Um, <laughs> so so the first person I will tease is is Harry Boyt. Um, who, if you've read his bio, you will know is, has been an influential uh, civic advisor and, and helped kind of create a, a, a national civic agenda uh, for two different presidents, and even earlier than that as part of the, the civil rights movement. Um, you will not know, unless you have read the full, full bio, that he served in the same capacity in the court of Louis XIV, um, uh, <laughs> that he helped, uh, was instrumental in the flowering of civic ideals in the uh, regime of Sully and the Mind the Magnificent, um, and also uh, helped to refine the theory of public work uh, in the reign of Genghis Khan. So, uh, <laughs> Harry, please. <laughs> Even, <laughs> he's not gonna get up anymore. He's, <laughs> he's gonna go home now. <laughs> I'm sorry. Good evening. R reminds me that when I say I worked for Martin Luther King, students still say, and you're, you're still alive. <laughs> I'm pleased to be here. Uh, I, I spend summers in South Africa, so this is the first time I've been able to be at a conference. Um, it was kind of a compromise. I, I stayed later, and the schedule changed. So democracy has shrunk. It needs an awakening. That's my argument. And we are all faced with the challenge of regrowing the democratic imagination, our understanding of democracy. In Democratic Vistas, Walt Whitman wrote, we have frequently printed the word democracy, yet I cannot too often repeat that it is a word the gist of which still sleeps quite unawakened, whose history remains unwritten. A great word. As democracy has shrunk, greatness has been lost. We need to awaken democracy. So concepts are power resources in society. In his recent book, Pragmatist Democracy, Christopher Ansel makes the point that elites skillfully manipulate and control definitions of concepts. But also, they contend with audiences who have potential power to arbitrate the use and meaning of concepts. Concepts are the way we look at the world and process information and understand our experience. Shrinking of democracy is in the service of elites. Our challenge is to develop publics with the power to contest narrow definitions and to awaken larger meanings. That's my basic argument. So as a college student in the civil rights movement, I learned a very broad, vital understanding of democracy as a way of life, with cultural and economic and social dimensions, not simply electoral dimensions. <clears throat> this was what Martin Luther King talk, meant when he said the movement was bringing the country back to the great wealth of democracy. Septima Clark, who founded the Citizenship Education Program, one of the founders, uh, and was a philo philosopher of democracy, said the point is to broaden the scope of democracy to include everyone and deepen the concept to include every relationship. And this understanding of democracy as a way of life drew on a rich history of popular movements in the 1930s, of land-grant colleges and community colleges which called themselves democracy colleges, of the writings of John Dewey, of the great work of the Harlem Renaissance which had a a deep understanding of democracy as a way of life and citizens as co-creators of that way of life. In 1947, President Truman's Commission on Higher Education declared that the point of higher education <clears throat> is that it shall be the carrier of democratic values, ideals, and processes. 
<coughs> today democracy has shrunk dramatically. So the official definition of democracy on the US government website and the AID, <coughs> democracy refers to a civilian political system in which the legislative and chief executive offices are filled through regular competitive elections. That is the official democracy definition. But this isn't only a government problem. The scholarship about democracy has shrunk understandings of democracy. And there's no more vivid case than Robert Putnam's two books that are well known. His first book, Making Democracy Work, about Italian regional governments, describes regional governments which are effective to the extent that they exist in dynamic interaction with robust civic cultures and citizens. Right? Well researched. His new book, On Inequality, a tremendous gathering of evidence about inequality, has shrunk the definition of democracy to mean, quote, the equal voice in government is the essence of democracy. The idea of robust civic cultures has disappeared. This isn't only Putnam's problem. This is a larger problem of the literature. And I would say it ref reflected in everyday practices. So democracy has shrunk, and along with its citizenship, has shrunk to basically meaning voting and volunteering in the vernacular. We had a very vivid example of this when we did a, our Center for Democracy and Citizenship. Did a town meeting with a little town outside of Minneapolis called Fridley that wanted to talk about what citizens could do in response to terrible school shootings like Newtown. This was in 19, uh, 2013, right after the Newtown shooting. There were about 30 people there hosted by the mayor, city manager, sheriff, uh, school teachers, principals, social service agencies, businesses, four college students, and two elderly residents. And we asked people to go around. When we got to the residents, this was the staff, a couple of staff people from the CDC and I were there. The residents said, we really care about this issue, but we're sorry there are only two citizens in the room. And we waited, and nobody said anything until we pointed out that if people thought about themselves as citizens through the work they were doing and their sites as civic sites and schools and businesses and government, there would be vastly more power to address the issue of school violence. <clears throat> so in our judgment, what's, what our South African colleague Kalela Manku out of the black consciousness tradition calls technocratic creep has occurred throughout our institutional life. A technocratic uh, creep involves the increasing authority and power of credentialed experts who are described as scientifically trained, and that's a long discussion. But I want to focus here on a, on a deeper problem that the new encyclical by Pope Francis describes brilliantly, which is the epistemological problem which is the shift from relational approaches to dealing with human problems to informational approaches. The way he, Francis puts it in the encyclical, the basic problem goes even deeper than concentrated economic and knowledge power. It is the way humanity has taken up an undifferentiated and one-dimensional paradigm that exalts the concept of a subject who, using logical and rational procedures, gains control over an external object. He adds the technocratic paradigm extends to economic and political life. So what is the everyday consequence of this? It's that <clears throat> professional systems see themselves outside the civic life of communities. Look at the language in any professional system, even those most collaborative talk about working with citizens. So this is a problem we've taken up in our work over 25 years. And public work as a concept comes out of that. Um, public work means collaborative work by a mix of people to produce something of civic value. <clears throat> uh, it also means making work more public, more uh, work by publics, in public, for public purposes. And let me describe one example. So in 1990, I started an, an initiative called Public Achievement, a youth empowerment initiative, partly to um, and Jay Tice over here has been a longtime colleague in this from Lone Star, um, partly to acquaint young people with the empowering practices and larger understanding of democracy I'd learned in the, the civil rights movement, 
uh, in public achievement, young people do projects they choose, they work as teams, they're coached by adults. And we saw early on in St. Bernard's School with the principal Dennis Donovan that public achievement, which has results in uh, often striking ways, has much deeper results and impact if teachers themselves begin to think of themselves differently as citizen teachers, working in an empowering way, not an instructional way, learn how to make change themselves. And in the last several years at Augsburg College, where we've moved our center, the special education faculty has picked this up. So now special education, as mo many of you know, stigmatizes kids, uh, treats them as individuals, tries to do remedial pedagogies. In the special education program at Augsburg, students, all the students, candidate, teacher candidates, are working in an empowering way in 15 uh, elementary and high schools across the Twin Cities. <clears throat> We've seen dramatic changes in the students. Um, students who were stigmatized and locked away have become community leaders on issues like bullying and <clears throat> cruelty uh, at, to, towards animals and healthy lifestyles, a whole series of issues. We've also seen major change in the teaching and the teaching pedagogies in schools. And the students in special education at Augsburg, all 30 every year are fired with the idea they are going to be citizen teachers who are change agents to change education and to bring a sense of agency and hopefulness and transformation in, in educational cultures. Now, I would say that's the frontier of democracy. The question is, how can we generalize this? to a larger narrative of what democracy means. And let me say that I think there's <clears throat> two things. One, there are lessons from the March on Washington. People remember King's speech, but it was a march as a whole which made a citizenship statement to the nation in a neighborhood dispute, read the program uh, notes. There may be stunts, rough words, and hot insults, but when a whole people speaks to the government the quality of the action and the dialogue needs to reflect the worth of the people and the responsibility of the government. That was tying the struggle against segregation to a responsibility for the whole democracy. That was paying attention to problems of democracy as a whole, not simply in democracy. And I would say that's our challenge. How can we, for example, use the election season in the coming election to raise definitional problems of democracy, challenge candidates to say they're not going to solve our problems for us, prepare students to talk about their own work as examples of democracy, and perhaps advance measures like the idea of expected voting that, uh, that Australia has that raise all these issues. So I think our challenge is to reawaken the large and inspiring and inspiriting understanding of democracy which has fueled every broad movement for social change in America. Thank you, Harry, my friend, mentor, who hopefully will still be speaking with me after this conference. <laughs> so uh, we're going to give you a chance to, um, oop, yeah, so talk a little bit about what you just heard, and we'll do this after each of the short takes. Oh, I see. There we go. Okay, hold on. No, no. There we go. So, and I think this might be even better actually just, just in smaller, in twos or threes. I mean, you know, have chance to, more of a chance to speak. So if you just, uh, for 10 minutes or so, you know, talk to your turn to your neighbor, talk about, you know, yes, I agree with something. Huh, I don't think I buy, hmm, I think we should know more about, or wait, what was that Donald Trump joke again? 